Greetings and welcome back. We are now in Senior AP English, I'm sorry, Senior English A, and we are working with uh, the play Macbeth. We are now ready for Act 2, Scene 1, Scene 2. Now I'm going to make some observations, so we're going to listen to this thing, then we're going to come back to make some final observations. Uh, <clears throat> these two scenes, put them in your notes, these two scenes go together. In other words, when you watch the play performed on stage, you never know the difference between the two scenes. They're one nice flowing scene. So let's outline real quickly what's going on. First of all, we will have in 2-1 the introduction uh, again of Banquo. He will be with his son Fleance, a young boy. Their job is to be a night watchman, to watch the battlements in Eden. The goal is for uh, Banquo to, uh, you know, help his son when Macbeth shows up. Now, Macbeth will will have a brief comment to uh, to Banquo, and uh, then Macbeth will be left alone on a soliloquy uh, of his own. I'm with you now on page 362. Now, this is a hard scene to listen to. It's much easier to watch, and here's why. Are you ready for this? Macbeth starts to hallucinate. Now, what does that mean? He sees things that aren't there. And what he sees is a bloody dagger, a knife, with blood all over it. When he reaches for the dagger, he can't grab it. Now, there's two ways to... Uh, there's two ways to perform this on stage. One is that there's nothing there and he just sees it, but we the audience know that he's just seeing it because there ain't nothing there. Another way to do this is to actually have a prop where you drop it kind of down out of the ceiling and every time he reaches for it, the knife will go up back into the darkness again so you can tell that he's seeing it, but not actually, it's not actually there. Macbeth is seriously worked up at the end of 2-1 as he gets ready to go and do what really is a dastardly deed to kill the old man Duncan. Okay. Now we already commented on the fact that this is a pretty insane plan that we're going to blame bodyguards whose job it is to defend the king we're going to smear blood all over them while they're lying there drunk and then when they wake up in the morning the dead body of Duncan is in between them and the obvious question will be dude why did you kill the king and they will of course report I can't remember killing a king but we were partying pretty hard last night with Lady Macbeth and that's the last thing we recall it's you know this this doesn't occur to Macbeth Lady Macbeth that when those guys wake up they're obviously going to have a thing or two to say about the last thing they were doing and it was of course messing around with Lady Macbeth Needless to say, Lady Macbeth on 363, again, I'm just setting you up here. On 363, Lady Macbeth comes in uh, to the, uh, comes onto the stage, and she will say, that which hath made them drunk hath made me bold. What does that mean? What's Lady Macbeth been doing with the bodyguards? <coughs> Wine and wassail is the phrase that she will use earlier. Wine, I think you know about. Wassail, you can do your own Google search for. Let's just say that Lady Macbeth will go to any means to make sure that these guys are vulnerable. Shall we say it that way? Lady Macbeth, man, she, I mean, she, she will do what she has to do to get what she wants. What does she want? Power. Yeah. Yeah, it's interesting to say it, power or to be queen. It, notice that in both of those answers, neither of you said anything about, Lady, about Macbeth himself. That is to say, she wants to help her man out. Notice, both, both comments, power and to be queen, doesn't say anything about Macbeth himself. Of course, by extension, to be the queen, he must be the king. And yet, you're kind of right. It seems like mate Lady Macbeth is pretty much into this project for her own benefit. She will come onto the stage, ironic here, Mr. Keeley, and she will say all kinds of Freudian overtones here. I would have killed him myself, Duncan. I would have killed him myself because the bodyguards now are drunk asleep on the floor next to the bed. But he looked too much like my daddy for me to stab him. So I'm going to have to let Macbeth do it. She then is standing there, and off stage you will hear voices, like kind of shouting, like, hey, hey, what, hey, what, like, like that kind of stuff. And then all, and, and, and it'll, it'll, 
She's jumpy, right? She's jumpy. And then onto the stage will come Macbeth himself. A couple of things for your notes before you listen to this. Again, this is a scene much preferred to be watched than to be listened to. Some of you will lament the fact that we didn't have the advantage of these lectures last semester before we watched the performance of Macbeth because then when you were watching the play, you would be able to kind of pay attention to a scene like this. Macbeth comes on stage, two things about him. One, he's got to be covered in blood. You got to be covered. You, it, uh, for you to stab someone sleeping with double knives, there's a lot of blood that's going to come out of that body. Got me? So that's the first thing. He's got blood all over. Certainly on his hands, certainly on the knives. Are you ready for this? He comes onto the stage with the knives in his hand. He's holding the weapons that he's jacked the old man with. Okay? The second thing I would say about Macbeth when he comes on stage is his face. You got to be a good actor to play this role well because when he comes on stage, his face looks like there is something seriously wrong with him. A good way, a single word to describe it is simply horror. That is to say, incredible fear. All right? Now, we've already seen that Macbeth has this tendency towards hallucinating and that his heart really was at 100% in, in the taking of this old man's life. But when he comes on stage, he does not look like the guy we saw in 1-3 who said so foul and fair a day I have not seen. It does not look like that guy. He is already starting to look like a broken man. Now, let's point out something that Shakespeare understands about the criminal mind. And you can put this in your notes as that, the criminal mind. It's Shakespeare's understanding of the criminal mind. Shakespeare gives us a criminal, <clears throat> and not unlike a number of criminals. For example, uh, Mr. Nelson said, if you go into the prison system and you sit down with individuals who have taken the life of another person, a murder, it's interesting to do those kinds of interviews. Often they will say the following. Look, here's the thing, uh, premeditated murder. Here's the thing. I knew I was going to kill him, right? I knew, I knew. It was all set up. The plan was totally set up. And it was really weird because before I got ready to kill him, it seemed like everything was just going really, really fast. Like, like I was almost spinning in a vortex is often the language that's used. Then all of a sudden, I took out my gun and whoo, I blew him away. In the moment that I blew him away, many serial killers will report this. Many killers, murderers will report this. In the moment, whoo, I blew him away, there's this weird thing that happens where time seems to go and just stop. Like the, the language they will often use is stand still. It's like time stands still. And all of the senses are really elevated. So for example, murderers who have shot someone will report what the sound or what the smell of the gunpowder was like out of their firearm. It's like really strong in their nostrils. Or for example, if blood hit them, because if you shoot someone, blood comes back usually. If blood hit, the smell of the blood, the feel of the blood, all of the senses are really heightened. And it's like all the time just goes and just stops. But then the third part is the, what happens immediately afterwards. And many, many killers have reported this. Where all of a sudden, it's like from a dead standstill where, if, especially with the firearm, because it's usually so close, the ears are ringing. Again, all the senses, what you can hear, what you can taste, what you can uh, feel, all that, see, all of that. And then all of a sudden, it's like the world starts spinning really, really quickly. We know that the majority of criminals, murderers, are actually caught in the first couple of hours after they commit the murder. Weird stories. Like, for example, they'll blow somebody away, and then they'll go and get in their car and put the pistol on the seat next to them, and they'll run three straight red lights. And when the police comes up to them to check on, dude, you just ran the, the red light, there's the, there's the gun, and they've got blood on their face. And that's how they get caught. Happens all the time. The real criminal is the one who can commit the crime and then walk away from the crime without getting caught. In other words, got his head about him, his wits about him. Shakespeare will show us this on stage, and that's what makes this scene so remarkable. Macbeth will kill the old man, but he'll come on stage and he's a broken man. It's fairly evident that there's something wrong with Macbeth. Lady Macbeth will do one of these. What is wrong with you? Straighten up, right? She will say something quite fascinating. A little blood cleanses us of this deed. 
Uh, I'm sorry, a little water cleanses of the of the steam. Meaning what? All you got to do is what? Go wash your hands. It ain't no big thing. She will say the dead are but a sleeping people. It's not to be feared. And then all of a sudden she realizes that he's got the knives in. She's like, what are you doing with the knives in your hand? Take them back in. He's like, no, no, I ain't going back in that room. I am not going to, I'm not going to look on what I've done. She will say you're a wimp. She'll say in firm a purpose. She'll take the knives. She'll go off stage. And while she's <laughs> off stage, all of a sudden there's this loud banging sound that starts happening, which will totally freak out Macbeth. Now what it is, is it's morning time. And the guys who are coming, his name is Macduff, we haven't met him yet, the guys who are coming to pick up King Duncan from the house of Macbeth, they're knocking on the front door. But every time they hit that door, it just freaks out Macbeth. Again, he's just totally freaked out. When Lady Macbeth comes back on stage, and Lady Macbeth is a changed woman. She will have blood on her. All right, and she ain't the strong, proud woman she was before. What she's looked at off stage has completely changed her as well. Notice Shakespeare doesn't show us the death of Duncan. Did you notice this? Put it in your notes. It's important. Why doesn't he show us the death of Duncan? Why does he have two actors come on stage with looks of horror on their face for what they've seen in a little bit. We'll have a third actor that will have seen that body in that bedroom stabbed to death multiple times. Why doesn't Shakespeare himself show these murder, this murder on stage? Now, when you see film versions of this, like a Roman Polanski version I'll show to you, you actually get to see the murder. It's, it's one of the high points in Hollywood. When they make Macbeth as a movie, they often will show this murder. Shakespeare didn't do it. How come? Imagination. That's right. It's a brilliant observation, Keeley. Shakespeare knows how to rely on the imagination of his audience. Holy cow. If that's the way a guy who could stand in the middle of the battlefield and slaughter people, slit them from their groin to their gullet and pull out all their innards, but when he comes on stage, he's that freaked out, what's it got to look like in that bedroom <coughs> where he stabbed that old man over and over again? It allows for the mind to do its work. Imagination. Macbeth will report while he was killing Duncan, that the two bodyguards set up, looked at each other in their drunken state, and started conversing to each other. One of the bodyguards started to say a prayer. They're drunk, started to say a prayer. As Macbeth is stabbing the old man, they start talking, conversing, and then one of them starts saying a prayer. Macbeth says he could swear that he heard a voice that whispered in the house, Macbeth hath murdered sleep. Nobody's going to sleep anymore in this house. And we'll find out that this is the case. From this point on, Macbeth cannot sleep. He has a difficult time getting any rest, which is why he'll begin to, to drink so much. He also says he tries, because they're saying a prayer, he tries to say amen at the end of their prayer. He can't say it. It's stuck in his throat. It starts to freak him out. Lady Macbeth will again point out, dude, you're just, you're just kind of a whack job right now. You need to just calm down. We need to just change our clothes. We need to clean the blood off our face. It ain't going to be no big thing. Of course, the biggest problem is what's going to happen when they discover the body of Duncan in those two drunk buddy bodyguards lying next to them. We'll get to that scene. It's coming. All right, here we go. Two, one, two, two. Again, we'll listen to them together as two scenes together. You want to follow along, all right? And then obviously as to, after we come back, we'll have more to say on both of these scenes. <laughs> Who goes to the night, boy? The moon is down. I have not heard the clock. She goes down at twelve. I take his later, sir. Oh, take my sword. There's husbandry in heaven. Their candles are all out. I take thee that too. This summons lies like lead upon me. Yet I would not sleep. Hours restrain in me the cursed thoughts that nature gives way to in repose. Give me my sword. Who's there? A friend. What, sir? Not yet at rest? The king is abed. He hath been in unusual pleasure and sent forth great largesse to your offices. This diamond he greets your wife withal by the name of most kind hostess, and shut up in measureless content. 
Being unprepared, our will became the servant to defect, which else should free of wrought. All's well. I dreamt last night of the three weird sisters. Huh. To you, they have showed some truth. I think not of them. Yet, when we can entreat an hour to serve, we would spend it in some words upon their business, if you would grant the time. At your kind's pleasure. If you shall cleave to my consent when it is, it shall make honor for you. So I lose none in seeking to augment it, but still keep my bosom franchised and allegiance clear, I shall be counseled. Could repose the while. Thanks, sir. The like to you. Go. Bid thy mistress, when my drink is ready, she strike upon the bell. Get thee to bed. Is this a dagger which I see before me? The handle toward my hand. Come, let me clutch thee. I have thee not. And yet I see thee still. Art thou not fatal vision, sensible to feeling as to sight? Or art thou but a dagger of the mind, a false creation proceeding from the heat-oppressed brain? I see thee yet, in form as palpable as this which now I draw. Thou marshals me the way that I was going. And such an instrument I was to use. Mine eyes have made the fools of the other senses. Or else worth all the rest. I see thee still. And on thy blade and dudgeon, gouts of blood. Which was not so before. There's no such thing. It is the bloody business which informs thus to my eyes. world. Nature seems dead, and wicked dreams abuse the curtained sleep. Witchcraft celebrates pale Hecate's offerings, and with a murder, alarmed by his sentinel, the wolf, whose howls his watch, thus with his stealthy pace. With Tarquin's ravishing strides, towards his design moves like a ghost. Thou sure and firm, said Earth, hear not my steps which way they walk, for fear thy very stones print of my whereabout, and take the present horror from the time which now suits with it. Whiles I threat he lives. Words to the heat of deeds too cold breath gives. I go and it is done. The bell invites me. Hear it not, Duncan. For it is a knell that summons thee to heaven or to hell. <laughs> Murder the 
they didn't wake each other. I stood and heard them. That they did say their prayers and addressed them get to sleep. They're two lodged together. One cried, God bless us, and amen the other. As they'd seen me with these hangman's hands. Listening their fear, I could not say amen when they did say, God bless us. Consider it not so Then wherefore could I not pronounce amen? I had most need of blessing and amen. Stuck in my throat. These deeds must not be thought after these ways, so it will make us mad. I thought I heard a voice cry, sleep no more. Macbeth does murder sleep. The innocent sleep, sleep that knits up the raveled sleeve of care. The death of each day's life, sore labor's bath, balm of hurt minds, great nature's second cause. Chief nourish of life's feast. Still it cried, sleep no more to all the house. Glams have murdered sleep. And therefore Cordor shall sleep no more. Macbeth shall sleep no more. Who was it that cried? Why were they there? Do I bet you no know strength to think so brain sickly of things? Go, get some water and wash this filthy witness from your hand. To bring these daggers from the place. They must lie there. Go, no, no, carry them, no, and smear no, the sleeping no, rooms with blood. I'll go no more. I'm afraid to think what I've done. Look on again, I dare not. In firm of purpose. Give me the daggers. <sighs> sleeping in the dead are but as pictures. Oh. It's the eye of childhood that fears a painted devil. If he do bleed, fire gild the faces of the grooms with all. For it must Whence is that mocking? How is it with me when every noise appalls me? What hands are here? They pluck out my eyes. Will all great Neptune's ocean wash this blood clean from my hand? No, this my hand will rather the multitude of the seas incarnate I'm making the green. A little water clears us of this deed. How easy is it then? Your constancy has left you unattended. Oh, what a no king. Get on your back on this occasion. Call us and show us to be watchers. Be not lost so poorly in your thoughts. It's a low by deed to a best of thou myself. Wake, Duncan, with thy knocking. I would thou couldst. Let's uh, let's talk for a let's talk for a few seconds now about this one uh, two one uh, two two scene. Again, you're putting together obviously your annotations for the uh, for the package you're about to hand in. We have already commented on some of the major themes of this play. One of those uh, themes we said early on in one one: fair is foul, and foul is fair. Hover through the fog and filthy air. The fact that you're not always going to be able to see very well what's going on. Let's point out that one of the implications of that theme is that a lot of times people will do things without realizing, for lack of a better phrase, the ripple effect. You know what I mean by that? So in other words, you do something or you say something and it doesn't occur to you that down the line that doing or saying something is going to come back to jack you. This is exactly what we will see in 2122. Macbeth will only, it'll only start to kind of, he'll begin to comprehend what it is that they have done. Another major theme, and we saw this in uh, 1-7, uh, uh, is this theme of manhood. This idea of what it means to be a man. Notice already we're playing this game again over on page 362. And Macbeth is looking at a false dagger. It's an illusion. It's a hallucination. And already he's beginning to doubt his own mind. He's got a weak mind, we might say. And this is already part of this discussion about what makes a real man. Let's go to that soliloquy real quickly of Macbeth. One more time. He's going, to, uh, he's going to talk about what it is he has to do. 
Notice on page 362, right before he has this soliloquy, Macbeth will say to Banquio, hey, uh, well, let's back up a little. Go to 360. <clears throat> Macbeth will be told that the king has given Macbeth a diamond. Do you see it on line 16? <clears throat> this makes it even more difficult for Macbeth. Here comes Duncan giving niceties to Macbeth, and Macbeth is going to turn around and kill the old man, right? So, I mean, it's kind of sad. Notice Macbeth will say, Being unprepared, our will became the servant to defect, which else should free have wrought. In other words, an interesting sidebar. This is dramatic irony. Notice your, your sidebar will even suggest this, right? Uh, Macbeth tells Banquio that he and his wife couldn't entertain the king uh, as they would have liked, of course, this notion of entertaining the king takes on nasty double meanings. Yeah, we're going to take care of the king. The way we're going to take care of the king is by planning to slit his throat. Nasty. He's giving them diamonds, and they're going to give him, you know, cuts in the throat. Notice Macbeth will, uh, Banquo will say, all's well. It's no big deal if you weren't there. And then Banquo will say, I dreamt last night of the three weird sisters. Notice he, they're not called witches here, they're called weird sisters. He says, to you they've shown some truth. Wow. You know, remember you were like promised to be Thane of Kaldor and all of a sudden it happened. Wow, to you they've shown some truth. Notice Macbeth's response. Total lie. I think not of them. Yeah, I don't even know what you're talking about. What, ta what? what are you talking about? I don't even know what you're talking about. Dude, I, I've totally forgotten about those. Oh yeah, that's right. We saw those three weird... Then, look what he says. Oh, yeah, by the way, yet when we could entreat an hour to serve, we would spend it in some words upon that business, if you would grant the time. Put it in your own words. What's he say? I'd like to talk with you about that. You know that thing about those three sisters, those weird sisters, those witches and their prophecies? I'd like to talk about you, about it with you. And Banquio says, top of page 362, at your kindest leisure. Dude. Uh, any, anytime you want. I'm, I'm more than free to talk about that. To which Macbeth says, if you shall cleave to my consent, it's interesting the word cleave. What does the word cleave mean? Does anyone know what a cleaver is? You got it, that which cuts. If you should cleave, cleave also means to clean, right? It has two meanings, both to split asunder and to clump, come together. If you should cleave, if you shall cleave to my consent, when it is, it shall make honor for you. Put it in your own words. What's he say to Banquo? I got something I want to talk to you about that could bring honor to you, right? I could bring honor to you. Look at what Banquio says. All right, so I lose none in sinking to augment it. Wow, what has he just said? This is an important observation. This sets up the real man versus the false man. Who's the real man? Banquio. What does he say about getting honor? Macbeth says, hey, 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 I want to talk to you about something. You could get a lot of honor. What's Banquio's response? Sure, I'll talk to you as long as in gaining honor, I don't what? Lose any honor. Right? Well, now that's ironic. Why? Because what's Macbeth trying to gain? Honor, power, ambition. But obviously to get it, what did we say? He got what he wanted, but what? He lost what he had. You got it. He lost what he had. All of the honor that Macbeth had, he's about to lose. Then we, got, then we get into this, uh, we get into this um, uh, soliloquy at line 60. Whilst I threat he lives, words to the heat of deeds, too cold breath gives. In other words, I got to get this done now. We got to go, we got to go, we got to go, right? The idea here is he doesn't want to think about. He wants this act to be thought less. And off he goes. Notice he will say, Duncan, it's a knell, the bell, that summons thee to heaven or to hell. I'm going to jack you. This is it. Lady Macbeth then will come on stage. And when you have this back and forth, notice when Macbeth comes on stage on 363. Macbeth will say, I have done the deed. Didst thou not hear a noise? I heard the owl scream, back to bird theme again, anytime an owl screams. Uh, by the way, some of you are kind of getting a little bit freaked out by all that wind <coughs> last night. See, in Elizabethan times, a bunch of you would not have come to school this morning. Why not? Because in Elizabethan times, all that wind last night, 
bodes something bad is happening. They were very superstitious people. If they saw a black cat, immediately went indoors and stayed the rest of the day. If they saw an owl, serious bad omen to, have, to see or hear an owl. These are all bad signs, okay? I remember giving this lecture once and one of my students said, oh, my grandma's like that. She's very superstitious, and if there's certain things that happen, like she once saw an owl, she immediately drove home and went inside, and she stayed for the rest of the day and did not come out because she is freaked out by it. See, this is the kind of superstition. Notice she will say, Lady Macbeth will say, yeah, I heard an, I heard an owl, if that's what you're talking about. I heard an owl scream. Did you not speak? Notice Macbeth. When? Now, she says, as I descended, I, heart. Notice these little staccatoed lines. What's Shakespeare doing? Write it down in your notes. What's he accomplishing with these little one word, two word back and forths on stage, going back and forth between each other? He's creating tension, isn't he? Drama, dramatic tension. Macbeth is seriously on edge. He has committed the murder, but he is one freaked out guy. It's one thing to commit an act. It's another thing to live with the act. Which is why oftentimes we believe serial killers or mass murderers take their own life. They realize in the moment of the execution of people, number of people possibly, that they can't live with themselves. So they take their, they take their life. Notice here, um, he will t he'll tell about, he'll, he'll say it's a sorry sight, you know, the blood all over his hands. I'm at the top of 364. A foolish thought, Lady Macbeth will say, to say a sorry sight. Come on, knock it off. This is just killing somebody. It ain't no big thing. And then he'll say, there's there, these two bodyguards. First they started laughing. Then they set up. Then they started praying. And then I could have sworn I heard the house say, Macbeth hath murdered sleep. The thane of Cowder hath murdered sleep. And to that degree, uh, yeah, it's, it's no good. It's no good. He couldn't say Amen. Lady Macbeth will say something very fascinating at line 32. And this is one of the reasons why we read this play and don't just watch this play. Look what she says on page 364, at roughly line 32. These deeds, what deeds? Killing the king. These deeds must not be thought after these ways, so it will make us mad. What does she say to Macbeth? Don't think about, don't think about it. Just don't think about it. You can't think about this, because if you start thinking about what you've done, it's going to drive you nuts. Are you ready for this for your notes? One of the reasons why psych majors will read this play. This play was actually introduced to me as a psychology major long before as a humanities scholar. This play shows what happens when a guy does a terrible deed and then he has to live with it. This play shows the declension into madness. It will actually on stage show you what it's like to lose your mind. We, how do we already know Macbeth's starting to lose his mind? What happened earlier in this act? He started hallucinating and thinking he saw stuff that wasn't actually there. That's the first indication. Now she will say it out loud. You can't think this way, it'll lose you. you know. Me thought I heard a voice cry, sleep no more. Macbeth had murdered sleep, the innocent sleep, sleep that knits up the raveled sleeve of care. The death of each day life, sore labor's bath, balm of hurt minds, great nature's second course, chief nourisher in life's feast. A multiple ways to say, if you can't sleep, by the way, this for your uh, notes is what we call in psychological terms, you've probably heard this, sleep deprivation. We know how to make someone lose their mind. It's pretty simple. All you have to do is monitor their sleep patterns, and when they start dreaming, wake them up. They'll be, they'll be completely nuts in a matter of days if you do this. Really? It's not because of their lack of sleep. It's because of their lack of dreaming, their ability to ever hit REM sleep. You can do this relatively easy, and we know tragically that this kind, these kinds of studies were conducted in, for example, different kinds of prison camps during the Second World War as they began to try and test the limits of, if you really want to jack with somebody, don't let them sleep. Of course, some of you have had to go for several hours without sleep, like maybe you decided, I'm going to go a couple of days and I'm not going to sleep. Some of us maybe in work situations where we had to do it or whatever. And all of a sudden, weird things. Our, our mind just starts doing weird things. You're not real good with driving vehicles and stuff after a day uh, or two without sleep. Your, your senses, your reaction time is not good.